Hi folks and welcome back to Physics with Captain Rod. Uh, the purpose of this video is to provide an example here of applying uh, Newton's second law to circular motion. So what we're looking at here, we've got this uh, five kilogram object attached to this two meter string and it's going in a circle. It's important to know that this is a horizontal circle so the height of this object is not changing in this example and it's going in a circle in such a way that we've got a 40 degree angle here, 40 degree angle here with the horizontal. And what we're going to try to do here is calculate uh, the time, what's called the period, the time it takes this ball to complete one revolution. Now, <clears throat> um, first let's talk about, you know, where do we start? Well, there's two main methods that uh, are used for analyzing problems in physics. Newton's second law, right, which is F equals MA, and again, remember that's a vector law, and there's principles of work and energy. And if you've had me in class or you've you know, listened to some of my videos, you probably know that I'm a, I'm a big believer in the work energy theorem as far as uh, attacking physics problems because you know, I always say this, if you can use the principle of work and energy, do so. It's almost always the easiest way to uh, solve uh, most, most problems in physics. It's a very easy theorem to apply because it's a scalar law and it makes it mathematically very uh, simple. However, in this example, this thing's potential energy as it goes round and round is not changing. There's no work done and there's no changes in kinetic energy either. So any sort of work energy equation we're going to write is, is just going to simplify down to zero equals zero. And although that's true, it's not particularly useful uh, for this problem. The work energy theorem, um, in order for it to be of use, you have to apply it in situations where there are changes in potential or kinetic energy. And that's just not the case here. So this problem is going to default to Newton's second law. All right, if it's going to default to Newton's second law, the first thing we need to do is draw a free body diagram. Now, um, I'm going to pick one of these, and it doesn't matter which. You can literally uh, flip a coin. I'm just going to uh, choose one of these uh, instances in time. I'm going to go ahead and uh, choose this one right here. If we draw a free body diagram of this object at this instant in time, there are two forces acting on it that are important. First is a gravitational force, and I'm going to go ahead and put that force vector in. Mg. Next, remember when you're drawing free bodies, imagine a surface, uh, like an imaginary surface just off the surface of how you're defining your system. And you're looking for influences coming from outside of this boundary. You'll notice that rope crosses that boundary right there. That's going to create a force on this object. And that force is going to be right along the direction of that rope or that string. And that's an example of what we would call a uh, tension force in physics. Oops, green still. And I think what I'll do is just off-center off that just a little bit so we can see it. All right. So that tension, again, is acting right along that line, and it's in up and left. You'll notice I did not bother drawing that tension vector ending here. I see that a lot in physics. The length of this vector has really nothing to do with the length of the rope in the picture. I mean, it is ultimately related algebraically, but there is no reason at all to draw the length of this tension vector uh, ending right here. Right. Now, <clears throat> there's no other forces acting on this thing. Now, let's talk a little bit about the motion. And think in terms of like left, right, up, down. Or if I were to put a coordinate system maybe like this, x, and this y, and I'll talk about why I did left positive here in just a moment. The y coordinate of this ball as it goes around in this horizontal uh, circle is not changing at all, but the x coordinate is. And you'll notice that you know some, half the time it's basically going to the right, half the time left. So the coordinate and velocities horizontally are changing. This thing is undergoing a circular motion, therefore centripetal acceleration is relevant. The centripetal acceleration vector, I'm going to draw it in. I'm going to put this in red. Is in this direction. Now it's important to note that's not a force in the free body, right? That's the acceleration of this object at the instant shown. This is why I did left positive because my standard rule of thumb for writing Newton's second law equations is identify the acceleration direction call that positive. All right, so I think we're ready, ready to uh, 
write a uh, pair of force equations. First one I'm going to write. The sum of all forces in the y direction must equal zero because just by observation this thing's not accelerating up or down. The y coordinate of this object is not changing in any way shape or form. So as far as the y direction is concerned this is an equilibrium problem. I'm going to go ahead and do up positive. It uh, doesn't matter we could do down positive but now to write this equation we're going to need some geometry of this triangle here. So let's kind of look at the geometry of the problem. So it's a 40 degree angle, also 40. That makes this interior angle here, let's see, 40, 80, 100 degrees. Because it's 180 from here all the way to here. And I subtracted off 40, subtracted another 40. If I were to draw a vertical line, that's going to make this one 50. And now from this triangle, that's going to make this one 40 degrees. So when I now sum forces y direction, I want the y component of this force vector. Now if I kind of imagine this force vector in component form, it's got a component this way and a component up. The one I want is the one that's up, opposite the 40 uh, degree angle, so it's equal to T sine 40. So the first term is going to be T sine 40 degrees for the y component of this force vector. All right, looking here, we've got a force vector mg that's straight down, so minus mg, and that's it, equals zero. Now, I'm going to take note at this point, I can numerically calculate a tension because I know a mass and I know the gravitational field strength. For now, I'm just going to write it mg over sine 40 degrees. And again, I, I could calculate a number, but the tension is not what I'm after anyway. Next equation to write. All right. Sum of all forces in the x direction equals ma. And I'm calling left the positive x direction because I know that's the acceleration direction. I look at my free body. I note that mg does not have a component in the x direction, but the tension does. Now I erased it before, but remember these tension components look like uh, tension x, tension y. The component of the tension that's in the x direction is adjacent to the 40 degrees. So its magnitude is going to be T cosine 40. And that is the only force component that's to the left. So this is net force x direction equals m a. But the acceleration is equal to v squared over r because it's a centripetal acceleration. All right, now the million dollar question, what do we do about this r here? All right, so we go back to the picture and we study the geometry. Now I'm going to draw a triangle in green that I'm going to use to find that r. So it's all about this triangle here. In this triangle, this angle would be 50 degrees. And the hypotenuse is basically the length of the rope. I mean, that's going to depend kind of you know where it's tied, but this little distance is not a huge factor for this problem. I'm going to go ahead and just use the length of the rope for the hypotenuse. The r is this distance. That's the radius of curvature that this object is traveling around as it goes in this circle. That radius is opposite this length, opposite a 50 degree angle. So it's equal to L sine 50 degrees. And I can go ahead and calculate a value for that, but I'm going to hold off and do that at the end. All right. So now, starting to keep in mind, what is it we're after? I'm after the 10, or I'm sorry, a time period. This, this delta T was for time. It's a capital T because it's quite common to use a capital T for what's called the period, time to complete one cycle. In order to find that, I'm going to want this, the speed. So what I'm going to do is rewrite this equation, subbing this here. The new equation is going to read mg cosine 40 degrees over sine 40 degrees. That's my shorthand there for the cosines and sines. Equals mv squared over r. You notice the mass divides out. 
we can put the R over on the right, and I'm going to actually take that thing and algebraically move it over to the right. So what we have now is that V squared is equal to RG cosine 40 over sine 40. We'll go ahead and rewrite that one more time, where the R is equal to L sine 50. So I'm going to rewrite this line. R is equal to L sine 50 degrees right, times G times cosine 40 degrees over sine 40 degrees. I'm going to take a moment now and see if I can find V. I th think I'll pause this for a moment so the video stays short. Okay, there I'm back, and I got about 4.23 meter per second out of this. And again, I just put the 2 here, 9.8 meter over second squared here, times sine 50 times cosine 40 over sine 40, and then square rooted it, because don't forget that's v squared equals. All right, so um, we've got the speed of this object. All right, now I want to try, out, try to figure out how am I going to get the time. All right, so we know a speed, we know a time. The ref, rest of this problem is a motion problem, right? It's a study of motion. So I'm going to go ahead now and draw a graph that's very similar to a lot of other graphs I've drawn in, in problems. Right. And that's going to be a graph, except rather than velocity against time, I'm going to make this a graph of speed against time. I'll explain why here in just a moment. And speed is just magnitude of your velocity. All right, so, you know, technically speaking, the velocity of this object is constantly changing. It's constantly changing in direction. As this thing goes uh, like this, if I were to think of the velocity in terms of uh, an x coordinate here, it's a velocity to the left or right, half the time it's positive, half the time it's negative. So if, if this were, say, a Vx, that graph would look something like this. Or if this were a velocity, if I looked at the velocity component into or out of the page here, it would have a similar type of shape. All right, to simplify this graph down, I'm just going to make this a graph of speed against time. And the speed against time is constant at about 4.23 meter per second. Right, out to some time t. Now remember that um, these graphs have two important properties, slope and area. The area bound under a velocity curve, curve gives your displacement, or in this case, the area bound under this speed curve is going to give us the distance this thing travels. Right, so the distance that this thing travels is equal to 4.23 t. And I'm going to put NCU for note consistent units. So that's coming from this times this. Also, I'm going to take note that the distance, if I look at one complete cycle, is one circumference. So the next line is going to be 2 pi r equals 4.23t, right, where the r is equal to L sine 50. I'm going to go ahead now, and I guess let's just get that L sine 50. 2 times sine 50. I get about 1.53 for the radius. So that's this distance, 1.53 meters. So this 2 pi r is going to read 2 pi times 1.53 meters equals 4.23. This would have units of meter per second. Uh, again, they're consistent. I'm going to go ahead and just leave them out, uh, mainly because I'm short on space. But times t. So let's see what we get out of this. All right, and I get about 2.27 out of this when I solve this for t. 2.27 seconds. And that's what the period is called. So up here I called it a delta t here, uh, change in time or the time to do one complete cycle. That's going to be about 2.23 seconds approximately. Again, why is that a capital T? Well, generally speaking, we use lowercase t for uh, any given time. And p 
periods are special times. They're the time to complete one cycle. So a lot of times textbooks, it's pretty common for people to call the uh, period, which is a very specific time, uh, capital T. So in this example, this is not attention. You just have to learn in context uh, what this T represents. This is a time, uh, which in this example would be the period one time around. So again, uh, the point of this video is to demonstrate, you know, how to apply uh, Newton's laws of motion in a uh, case of circular motion, right? And it's all about draw the free body and write your Newton's second law equations. For this example, it's important to realize it's not accelerating vertically, but it is accelerating horizontally. And that acceleration is a centripetal acceleration. Therefore, its magnitude is V squared over R. Could have also drawn the free body here and the acceleration direction would be to the right. And all the equations would have been exactly the same. So anyway, hope this video helps demonstrate these concepts. Have a great day.